This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, hello, hello. Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. And we come to you from a beautiful old town, Scottsdale, Arizona. Believe it or not, it's not that hot these days. But anyway, we have a very important show because all of our shows are important. And it's on the subject called Bitcoin. And I've heard so many opinions on the thing. For example, you know, and I have no verification of this, but Buffett won't touch Bitcoin, but Buffett doesn't touch gold. And then there's guys like, um, I don't know what Ray Dalio does, but Jim Records, a friend of mine, he doesn't support Bitcoin and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I noticed one thing, they're all old guys. <laughs> so... <laughs> so. I thought at best we just keep an open mind and figure out what the young guys have to say about Bitcoin and why it's the investment, you know, it's the new gold or whatever you want to call it. So our guest today is Robert Breedlove. He is the founder, CEO, and CIO of Parallax Digital, a professional service firm specializing in crypto asset investment management and consulting for the emergency digital economy. And I think what's important is by training a CPA. So I have tremendous respect for that because it's always in the numbers. It's always in the numbers. And I was never good at numbers. That's why I have guys like Tom Wheelwright and my bookkeepers around me because I'm horrible with numbers. So I want to welcome to the program Robert Breedlove. And he's out of L.A. where they're, they're going to get rid of the police department next and we'll see we we'll see how that works out. But hey, Robert, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me, Robert. Now, we're not politically correct here, so why should old guys or young guys be looking at Bitcoin? I mean, there's a lot of story, hype, confusion, you know, and for guys like me who don't really know, we're not in depth in it, what's the main reason Bitcoin is your choice right now? Uh, well, I'd say at a really high level, um, no matter how you feel about politics, um, Bitcoin probably helps fix that. Because at the end game for Bitcoin is that it, it separates money from state control. And by doing that, it really it reduces a lot of the problems that the state creates in the world, um, which, you know, it, it finances itself exclusively through taxation and inflation. And, uh, you know, Bitcoin is just a free market money. It exists outside of the central banking system, um, whereas central banking is, you know, very much uh, a model based on socialism. It's literally the fifth dictate in Marxist playbook to have centralized control of cash and credit. Um, Bitcoin's a purely capitalist technology. It's an, it lives entirely in the free market um, on its own merits. So I, I agree a hundred percent with you because I, you know, I'm, I've been outside the central banking, the fed and, be a Bank of Japan, the European Central Bank. I just really don't trust those guys because it's manipulated by the academic and financial elite. But why Bitcoin? Because for a lame person like me, there are so many different coins, you know, like there's five new coins a minute coming out. So why did you come out so strong for Bitcoin? So it's very important uh, to understand Bitcoin from first principles and to, to understand it, you first have to understand how money comes into existence. And at a very basic level, any society that trades amongst its people necessarily produces a most tradable thing, right? Something becomes more tradable than everything else. And whatever that thing is, is money. So like in, in prisons, you have cigarettes, right? In ancient Africa, we had glass beads, we use salt, we use cattle, we use all these different things as money. Uh, based on the technological realities of the society shaping money. But what, what it comes down to are basically five critical properties. So money has to be divisible, so it can price things, has to be durable, which means it lasts over time, has to be recognizable, which means people can objectively verify it is what it is, has to be portable, so you can move it across space, and very importantly, it has to be scarce, verifiably scarce, and this protects it from people trying to debase its value over time, as we see central banks doing the fiat currency today. So when you see the Fed right now printing trillions of dollars, what goes through your head relative to Bitcoin? So it's, to get there, we have to answer actually how the Fed came into existence. And 
so across those five properties, basically gold became universal money, which everyone understands, right? Very clearly, but not very few people, I think, understand why, because it was the most divisible, durable, portable, portable, recognizable, right. and scarce asset. So across those five properties, um, Bitcoin is superior in every dimension. We can get into that more in a second. But what the Fed is, as a central bank, is they've basically hoarded the free market money and they've built a, a scheme on top of it, which I, I call, I like to a pyramid scheme. Right. And dollars originally were redeemable for gold, right? So they were actually, because gold is heavy and hard to transport, it was actually resolving the portability and recognizability right. concerns of gold by issuing a paper redeemable in gold. Right. But gradually over time, governments removed that, re that redeemability and they pulled off this, this long game ledger domain where they've got us all thinking in dollars now, but only because it used to be redeemable in gold. Right. So it's really, they've kind of like hacked the free market in a sense. And so, again, okay. central banking today, it's an, it's an anti-capitalist function. Well, I can right. think so, we're free market capitalists in the U.S., but we're absolutely not. Well, it goes back to what we call the fractional reserve, is that you could put $10 in the bank and they could print 10000 off That's of right. that. So, but why Bitcoin? You know, do you know what I mean? It's you and um, Anthony Pompliano, I mean, your, your discussion on the POMP show was extremely compelling, and I recommend people go and watch that program. It was really worth watching. But again, right. here I am, the layperson, an old guy, and there's five new coins coming out. There's ICOs everywhere and all this. But why Bitcoin? So the real short answer is there's only one analog gold for a reason, right? The value of money is found in its liquidity and its network effects. So for Bitcoin specifically, looking at it again across those five properties, first of all, it was first. It was released into the world at a time when no, no comparative technology existed, right? And because it's just pure information, it's basically infinitely divisible because it can be broken down and recombined at near zero cost. It's infinitely durable because information does not decompose. It's infinitely recognizable because it's, it's like the written word, right? This information is the most easily recognizable thing in the world. Uh, it's infinitely portable because it can move at the speed of light across telecommunication channels. And then very importantly, Satoshi combined basically economics and game theory with thermodynamics to make it absolutely scarce. We've never had anything in the world that exhibits absolute scarcity. So even with gold, for instance, if we could flip a switch right now and make everyone in the world mine gold, we could increase the supply very rapidly. So everything physical in the world is the function of our time necessary to produce it. But with Bitcoin for the first time in history, we have a money that you cannot increase the supply of whatsoever. There's only 20, there only will ever be 21 million and no one can change that. So it's like the three certainties in the world. We used to have death, taxes, taxes, and now we have the third, which is 21 million Bitcoin. But why couldn't I just start my own 21 million Kiyosaki coin? You absolutely can. And what, the thing about the that difference be? is there's a bit of a nuanced concept called path dependence as to why Bitcoin was first um, made it increasingly important. But, to create a money to say compete with Bitcoin, you have to actually fork the social layer. So you can go and create all the, the monies you want, right? Robert coin one to infinity, but then you have to convince people to sacrifice their Bitcoin or dollars or other forms of money to buy your coin. And the ingenious thing about Bitcoin is because it was first, it basically optimized all those properties for holders. So it's, it has zero unexpected inflation. It cannot be confiscated. It cannot be counterfeit. And so there's basically Satoshi left no design space for anyone to come in and disrupt Bitcoin. So it, again, it's for the same reasons we have one analog gold in the world, we're only likely to have one digital gold. So when you were on Anthony Pompliano's uh, program, you talked about, <laughs> this is what blew my mind apart when you were talking about zero. And you know, I, I, um, I studied not very well, but the Arab uh, numer num numer money number system. And the zero was a huge, 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 huge change of thought. That's zero. Some, nothing could hold a spot. And so one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you today, how does Bitcoin equal zero? That's right. So a little background on zero. It was discovered in 7th century India, actually, uh, India. by a mathematician named Brahmagupta. And he reportedly discovered it in meditation. 
So zero became a symbol for the experience of the void. So when you meditate, you try to basically uh, get past your thought, get past attachment to time and, and worldly things. So you experience this, this place of, of nothingness. And that's where he, he discovered zero. And by adding, and all numeric systems before that didn't have a concept of zero. But by adding the concept of zero, so a, a category for no categories, if you will, it radically enhanced uh, the utility of mathematics. So it gave us a gateway into the negative domain of numbers. By going into the negative numbers, we discovered the imaginary numbers, like the square root of negative, I, negative one. The imaginary numbers turned out to be a prerequisite for all software and wireless technology we use today. It also became the cornerstone of calculus, which literally everything we see, touch, feel, interact with on a day-to-day -day basis has its roots in calculus. My all favorite physical subject. sciences. Yeah, so <laughs> it's like, it's, it's hard. It's really a rabbit hole in and unto itself. But once you see that the discovery of zero enabled modernity as we know it, everything, every piece of tech, your home, like everything you touch is because we figured out zero. And I just liken that to the discovery of absolute scarcity for money. Because yeah. again, but before Bitcoin, it was impossible to permanently guarantee a fixed supply of anything because you can just allocate more time to producing it. So it was, a Bitcoin, design of the, it was a design of the product. That's right. So like the harder we try to produce Bitcoin, it's kind of like an ever receding horizon. Like it just becomes harder to obtain and all that's enforced in its algorithm. So it's a really like, it's a very paradigm shifting, not to be cliche, but uh, it's paradigm shifting invention. So this is my thing is that, you know, like when the fed prints a trillion, you know, when I was a kid, <laughs> when the, it used to be a million dollars they would print. And then mm -hmm. it went to a hundred million. And then it finally had pushed a billion. Then it went to a hundred billion. And then it went to a trillion. And I think a trillion is 12 zeros. So right. it takes, it takes less than a minute for the fed on a keystroke to print a trillion dollars. And the question I ask people, how long does it take to spend a trillion dollars? And I, I'm not really good at math, but the numbers I saw is that if you spent $1 a second, I think it would take like 34,000 years to spend a trillion dollars. And, and that's, Amazing. and that's what drives guys, guys like you crazy is how can they just keep hitting more zeros when Satoshi went the other way and there was fewer zeros, there's fewer numbers. That's right. And, and you know, inflation is not a naturally occurring phenomenon. It is purely a mode of taxation. And so I think when you start looking at central banking as less of an economic story and more of a crime story, you're starting to get the picture. I, love, I mean, it I really love, is, is I love what you're saying. I love what you're saying. <laughs> it is, it's an apparatus for theft. It's designed to siphon value off of society until it collapses. And we've seen it happen time and time again. Like the inflation rate is inversely, inversely proportionate to social well-being. And you see that with any hyperinflating currency. What happens to social cooperation in Venezuela, right? You have cash in the streets. No one can trust anyone. No one can buy bread. How do you, how do you conduct your life? So Bitcoin just flips that whole thing on its head. It says we're taking inflation to absolute zero, which in theory would, would mean a society running on a Bitcoin standard could benefit in nearly infinite ways. Right. And the, the last thing before I go to break is what I was impressed with, which Anthony Pompliano explained to me was having, was it, I call it hardening. Mm -hmm. Would you explain that? You know, what is the having? Yeah. So every four years, the inflation rate of Bitcoin, which is the amount of Bitcoin produced per block, which is its ledger, it, cut, it gets cut in half. So it's subject actually to exponential decay. So just for, for easy numbers, this year we're producing about 329,000 Bitcoin per year. By the year 2100, that number per year has contracted to 0 0.31 Bitcoin per year. So we're talking about a drop of six orders of magnitude in 80 years. So again, there's this quote that the greatest shortcoming of mankind is his inability to understand the exponential function. So Bitcoin has a money, has an inflation rate subject to exponential decay. And that's why it's really hard for people to get their head around the implications of it. Good. So we come back, I'm gonna to talk to you about, because another thing that you mentioned on uh, Anthony's program, Pomp's program was a thing about the pyramid scheme. And that fascinates me. And, you know, cause I'm, I'm old enough that when I, in 64, 
they took the dollar off the silver standard. And up until then, the dollar was a silver note. And then our, all of our coins were made of silver. And then in 71, Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard, which opened the door for Bitcoin to just print uncontrollably. So I'm going to go into that pyramid, but you know the pyramid on the dollar bill with the eyeball on it and all that stuff? Yeah. yeah I don't know if yeah. that's, the, that's the pyramid you are mentioning because I don't know what it means and I'm not into that cryptology stuff and all that, but yeah. it seems so strange to me. And I agree 100% with you. How can we just keep printing this stuff and giving people, I call it fake money and it became fake money in 64 and 71. And That's all of right. these people are, are really happily accepting all of this fake money. Uh, pretty soon we'll have MMT, Marxist money, monetary theory and UBI, universal basic income. And doesn't that kill money? I mean, ultimately it kills it. So we come right. back, that's a discussion I wanna get into with, with you, Robert. But I wanna know this thing called the pyramid scheme and how the Fed is the one that holds the gold. And they have 8,000 tons or something. And everybody else is happy with money. So we'll be right back. We're talking about the pyramid scheme known as the Federal Reserve Bank. Thank you. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. And you can listen to the Rich Dad Radio program anytime, anywhere on iTunes, Android, or YouTube. And please, please leave us a review whenever you listen. You can hear the podcast again on richdadradio.com. We archive everything we produce on the show because repetition is how we learn. So if you, that means if you listen to this program one more time, you'll pick up twice as much. And it's very important if you have friends, family, and business associates, especially if they're trying to save dollars, that this is the program and, and as to why they may want to consider Bitcoin or some other type of currency. And <clears throat> I've been uh, not against the dollar, but um, I've, I came off the dollar in 71 when Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard. So I'm talking to Robert Breedlove, and he is the founder and CEO and CIO of Parallax Digital. He was on Anthony Pompliano's program. It was a powerful show. It was called An Open Letter to Ray Dalio, and mm -hmm. it was really about integrity. That's what your program was about. It was very well done and principles. And you were correlating how Bitcoin is about principles when the dollar has lost all of its principles. And so we're going to go into, and then what I love about Robert, he's a CPA by training. because That's probably the most important, you know, team member you got to have. Somebody's got to keep those numbers straight. But anyway, the thing we're going to talk about now is this, because he mentioned on Anthony's program, Again, the open letter to Ray Dalio. Please listen, watch that program. He talked about the pyramid. And when he was talking about it, this is the pyramid that came to mind. Not if you can see it. And I don't know, because I'm not into this crypto or this, this symbolism and secret societies and all that stuff, you know. But I wanted to find out now when you talked about the pyramid and you talked about how the Fed had 8,000 tons, I believe that's the number, of gold, and the rest of us had debt and dollars. And it just filters on down. And I call that, you know, I call it the shadow banking system. It's collapsing because that whole pyramid, you know, starting from the Fed on down is debt and um, just debt rolling downhill. And mama and pap, pop in the street are you know, hurriedly scrambling, working for dollars or whatever fake currency. And they're also trying to save fake dollars. And they're also trying to save money in their 401k or pension. And I was watching all the looting and rioting, you know, not too far from this office right here. And what I thought was kind of interesting is that the average guy does not realize that the Fed and the hedge funds are looting our pensions. You know, the, the looting still goes on. So I've asked Robert Breedlove to be as unpolitically correct as possible when we talk about this pyramid, but why he thinks that socialism and probably Marxism to have a Fed. So again, welcome back to the program, Robert. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, so 
again, as we reviewed in the first half, gold became money as determined by the free market because of its its properties, right? Scouts, which we laid out, and essentially, uh, banking. Originally, it was just because gold's expensive to move. People used to store it in warehouses, and then they would take a the, each person would get a warehouse receipt for their gold deposit, right? Right. Well, eventually those warehouse receipts became tradable because they were just a claim on gold, but they were easier to handle, right? Like the bank notes in your pocket. Right. So over time, this became the banking function and eventually became central banking. But essentially the problem with it, with it was that all the gold was centralized in one place and therefore all the trust became centralized in one institution. And that institution, of course, inevitably abused that trust function. So what they did is they started issuing more promises than they had money, right? More notes than they had gold and reserves. Uh, eventually, in 1971, as you mentioned earlier, uh, we went off the gold standard entirely with the Nixon, Nixon shock. Um, and from then on, it's just been these, it's dollars today are just an irredeemable government debt token, right? It's just a promise that will never be fulfilled by the government. Um, and so the pyramid scheme aspect, uh, symbology aside, I'm not sure about what the pyramid on the dollar means, but that's definitely interesting. Um, it be interesting to look up. Yeah, essentially yeah. there's the central bank sitting on real money, gold. They lend money into uh, the economy, right? So the, they buy government debt to put money into the economy. That money is then lent to successively lower tier banks. Uh, and by, this is the traditional functioning of the Fed. It's becoming much more exotic today. They're buying things directly like ETFs and, right. and things. But for simplicity's sake, the central bank puts this fake currency into the economy. Uh, they profit actually directly. So the Federal Reserve is a private institution. It pays a 6% annual dividend to undisclosed shareholders. So right. it's not a government entity at all. It's a private bank that runs the world. And they pass, and those first tier banks, loans to second tier banks, so on and so forth down the pyramid um, that externalizes all the cost, the inflation at the people at the bottom who hold dollars. So it's essentially what I like to call fiat currency is this pyramid scheme built on top of gold. So it's a fake monetary system. And, in, and the definition of a pyramid scheme, by the way, is an investment scam based on a hierarchical setup of network marketing. So they're imposing this system of network marketing on users of dollars and excluding all competition. So if you try to launch a competing money, they shut you down. But Bitcoin is interesting because it is totally immune to censorship and regulation. Right. The other thing that's interesting is this thing on interest rates is that when you're at the top tier of banks, that money is basically free. There's no, it doesn't come with interest, mm -hmm. but as it goes down the each succeeding layer of banks, so let's say that, you know, Robert and Robert wanted to start a payday loan company. We would go to one of these probably bottom layer ba tiered banks and we'd borrow, you know, a hundred million dollars and we'd have a payday loan company. So we might borrow that money at 3%, but we'd lend it out at 31%. And so what happens mm -hmm. is mom and pop or the poor with their payday loans, you know, they get effed. So they're, they're, they're struggling to make it because they can't make enough money. So they go to the payday loan company and they, they, I don't know what they do. I've never been to one, but they, they get charged these usurious rates, you know, some as high as a thousand percent. And that's the pyramid, isn't it? It keeps, it keeps, the shit rolls downhill. So is that what it says? Yeah, it's, you know, it's designed to privatize gains and socialize losses. So the Fed actually profits directly from producing dollars, like literally the, from the moment they enter the dollars into their database, which the dollar is just an SQL database maintained at the Fed. It's not even physically printed. They literally just control a database. Right. The moment they make those keystrokes, they're profiting from that money creation. Then each bank that receives it into the system is also profiting it. And anytime there's government losses, as we've seen with this monetization of debt ever since, especially since we went off the gold standard, they're just pushing the cost into society via inflation. So privatizing gain with seniorage, externalizing losses via inflation. And when you look at it that way, it's just like, it's a giant vacuum cleaner, just sucking wealth out of society and pulling it to the top. And the, the data proves that out, right? Wealth disparities have soared under central banking. And we know this, like if you look, uh, quick glimpse of history, 
When you destroy the middle class, society breaks down, right? There's no, there's no central substance and integrity to the society to maintain it. And central banking is just uh, it's doing a massive disservice to humanity. So you call it a, you call it a, the, the Fed a Marxist or what do you, I, mean, I love your. I, I say it's monetary socialism because if, if you read Marx's playbook, the fifth dictate again is the centralized control of money and credit. Whereas in a free, we don't do that in any other market, right? As free market capitalists. So we say the market must clear at what it must clear at, right? So wherever supply and demand meet, that is what the price should be. But the price of money, which is the interest rate, is not determined that way. It's centrally set by a, a board of seven governors versus being determined by the actions of free market participants. Um, so yeah, it is, it, I, I view Bitcoin and gold as monetary capitalism because they're, they're competing based on their own merits, essentially, their own monetary properties, whereas central banking is monetary socialism. Um, and the, a real simple definition of capitalism versus socialism is capitalism just means you get to own and control your own time. You control the fruits of your labor. That's all it really means. Socialism means the state controls it. The state gets to decide what to do with your labor, your time and effort and energy. Um, so yeah, we need a free market for money. So what is the ultimate argument uh, for Bitcoin and what, and what is the ultimate against Bitcoin? I would say, um, Again, seeing the success of gold throughout history is a very bullish indicator for Bitcoin because if you understand, if you're bullish gold and you understand why those five monetary properties, it's impossible not to be bullish Bitcoin because it's superior across all five. Um, you know, further, it's, <laughs> as we saw in the 20th century, we had this ideological struggle between Soviet Russia and the United States, right? So it was, Socialism versus capitalism. Does the state owning the means and ends of all production create a utopia or does, uh, you know, individual market actors deciding what's best for them? Is that a better system? So Soviet took this stance that they're going to control everything. In the U.S., we take the stance we're going to let market participants control everything except money. We never let go of the control of money. Um, and as we saw, you know, the 20th century clearly demonstrated that socialism does not work because it has these imposed rules and there's a cost to maintaining those rules. You have to, you have to enforce them. You have to constantly get people to comply. So like towards the end of the Soviet union, 40% of the people employed were informants, right? They were government informants trying to tell on people that were breaking the rules. It was illegal to be sad in the Soviet, Soviet union towards the end, <laughs> because if you're sad, that implies the state's not doing its job because it's a utopia, right? So it really, it has these crazy results, you know, hundreds of millions of people were murdered, starvation, it was a really bad outcome, right? So I think the argument here in the US is that we saw capitalism outcompete socialism, and now we're just going to see monetary capitalism outcompete monetary socialism. Because the only shortcoming of gold, the only reason we're not on a gold standard is because it's confiscatable. Right. Because it can be centralized and controlled and they can prevent you from having it. And in fact, the government did that. In the 1930s, we had Executive Order 6102, which outlawed uh, private ownership of gold under the threat of imprisonment or fine, um, up to 10 years in prison or a $200,000 fine, inflation adjusted. Right. So um, yeah, I think Bitcoin is just this unstoppable free market capitalist technology that outcompetes monetary socialism. Okay, so let me ask, because you're the young guy, do you, are you in the stock market? Uh, I am currently not, but I have been very actively in the past. But right now, I think we're in, you know, really dicey times with the stock market. And I'm sorry, I didn't answer the second half of your last question. Oh, the biggest threat to Bitcoin, in my humble opinion, is just black swan events. So a black swan is a true unknown unknown, right? Anything can happen. So it is a high-risk investment. I'm not saying it's 100% certainty, um, but... It's hard, hard to find an art, uh, a coherent argument against it, given its track record okay. so far. The reason I ask you this was because I was listening to Anthony Pompliano. He says, I don't have a stockbroker. I'm not in the stock market. <laughs> you know, I don't want any of this stuff. I mean, you guys are such, you guys are such hardcore rebels. I was going, that's, that's great because I don't have a stockbroker. I've, I've been in mining. I've mined gold and silver. And I'd rather just buy gold and silver than be in the mining business and playing mm -hmm. the stock market. 
But it gets it gets to the point where I just really would rather be outside that system, and that's why I too own Bitcoin. I just no. don't want to be part of the system. So, do you have a prediction? Everybody wants to know. You know, today it's around approximately ten thousand dollars a coin. Do you have a forecast? Let's say five and ten years for the price of Bitcoin. Um, you know, we we do some internal projections, but I I just like to look at it. Um, as far as an addressable market, what it's competing for. Uh, so just to give you some broad stroke uh, examples here. Gold has almost a $10 trillion market cap today. Uh, that figure, it tends to be suppressed though, because again, central banks own about 20% of the gold supply. Uh, they actively, they do all types of weird things like the London gold pool and different machinations to keep the price down because that's how they protect fiat from competition historically. So say gold has around a $10 trillion market cap. If, and Bitcoin, again, is superior across all properties of money to gold. So I think the, the first bar for Bitcoin to hit is just an equal market cap to gold. And if it, so if it hits that $10 trillion mark, you're looking at around $400,000 to $450,000 per Bitcoin. If you look at global money supply, which this number, um, there's different perspectives on this number, but global M2 is around 100 trillion, somewhere between 80 and 100 trillion dollars. If Bitcoin did ultimately become this uh, singular global asset or global reserve money, uh, it would be valued at around five million dollars per coin. Okay. So it's it's it is microscopic right now compared for what it is. And I think what we're seeing is just the market trying to digest this, you know, once in a 500 year type invention. It's the, you know, it's almost, that's why I equated it to the number zero. It's like, it's hard to even understand or imagine the implications of an innovation this big. We've never had an absolutely scarce money that is almost completely resistant to theft and confiscation. Uh, it's a network that can't be shut down by regulation. So it's like, it's imposing these capitalist monetary principles on the world. And I think, you know, as we know, as we generate more wealth through trade, so if we can have a world that's less regulated and more, uh, more heavily traded, it creates more wealth for all. So I think uh, Bitcoin is this gateway to, to a new type of society. Okay, so I got two, two last questions. You have, you have Libra, which is being produced by, I think, Facebook. Mm -hmm. That's right. I want your comment on that. And then your second thing is Paul Tudor Jones is one of my heroes. He just entered the Bitcoin universe. So... What do you think about Libra? And then what did you think about when Paul Tudor Jones entered the world, your yeah. world? So we see um, the world sort of shaking out to four monetary projects. And I, I, for simplicity, so I call it US coin, Fed coin, China coin, corporate coin, which I would put Libra as the leader in that category, and Bitcoin. Um, and essentially that when it, all things, assuming all those become digital, then money is really compete purely based on supply. Because again, money is just a single purpose technology. You're just moving value across time and space. So all things being equal, the scarcest money wins. So again, Bitcoin's already optimized for perfect scarcity. It has 0% unexpected inflation. There's no state that's gonna give up that right. That's how they, that is their core revenue stream. And then Libra, I think will just be pegged to national currencies. And then possibly over time become, you know, like a basket of say Fed coin and China coin. And over time, maybe it pegs itself to Bitcoin as well. Bitcoin continues to succeed. But in the distant long run, I think all of this collapses into Bitcoin as the base wow. base monetary protocol for a global digital non-state economy. I think that's really what we're moving into. As far as our boy Paul Tudor Jones goes, I think he's a great uh, ambassador. You know, he sees what he calls the great monetary inflation at hand. And you know the the scarcest liquid asset in human history, Bitcoin, is clearly the best hedge against that event. Right. And I have one final question because I'm the old guy. I still love gold. What's the possibility of a gold-backed crypto? Uh, those are they already exist. But again, I I am bearish on that Why because so? I think physically possessing gold will always have a value, right? There's gonna be a demand for a tangible store value that exhibits, you know, divisibility, durability, recognizability, portability, scarcity, which gold is proven, right? 5,000 years, proven history of being the best at that as a tangible store value. Um, but on the flip side, I think there's only gonna be one digital gold, 
which as we, we covered, Bitcoin is winning out there. So you don't, there's not room for a gold-backed crypto. It doesn't really add anything to, to gold because you still okay. have this counterparty risk, right? If I have a gold-backed crypto, who is verifying the ledger? Who's telling me I have uh, gold redeemability? Then you have to trust that person. Well, if the you gold? hold gold, you don't have to trust anyone, right? Right. I just have to trust the market. Same with Bitcoin. Right. If I hold my private keys, I don't have to trust anyone. I just trust the market determining its value. So once again, Robert Breedloff, I really want to thank you for being part of the program. And I rec highly recommend people watch you and Anthony Pompliano on your open letter to Ray Dalio. It was one of the more informative shows. It was it's longer than this format, but it was eye opening. And when you younger guys are more confident, more certain about what you're doing, it, um, and then you have, and you have, Paul Tudor Jones coming in on it, who's my generation. I think it's a time to start moving. So I've been buying Bitcoin for a while now, and I hope the price stays low for a while so I can accumulate more of it. But anyway, I, I thank you for sharing your wisdom and knowledge to the old guys like me and to the rich dad world. So thank you, Robert. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. And we come back. We'll be going into the final words on gold, silver, and Bitcoin. We'll be right back. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. I'm, again, I want to thank Robert Breedlove. I mean, some of these younger guys coming up now, man, they're, what I say, way down the road. They're in a different universe in this, in this world of money. And I'm an old guy because in 72, I started buying gold because of Nixon taking the dollar off the gold standard. So I have lots of gold and silver, and I just started getting into Bitcoin because of young guys like him. So I want to thank Robert Breedlove for sharing what he shares, because to me, it's a very confusing world. You know, if everybody can do what an, they call ICOs, initial coin offerings, and I've taken two companies public through IPOs, in initial public offerings, a gold company and a silver company, I never want to do that again. But anyway, uh, thank you, Robert Breedlove, his, and his program is an open letter to Ray Dalio. It's worth listening to. It's in much more depth, much more detail, and you'll understand the principles or the integrity behind um, Bitcoin, which I think is important we all understand. So Sarah, what did you think? You're the younger generation. What do you think of all that? So first I thought it was interesting because a lot of the people we've talked to about when it comes to crypto, they talk about it as a hedge. They don't really recognize it as a currency, but it is apparent he is saying this is a currency, right? It is, is what I'm understanding. So he's saying that this is um, a way to, like you always say, operate outside of the Fed. Yep. Um, and he sees this as a way um, because he, from what I gather, that's gonna, it could, it's going to collapse that system. And your only safe bet then is to, and I don't want to say invest because I, I, but to own Bitcoin as a form of currency. Yeah, a hedge is an insurance policy. And so, um, you know, when I see the, again, I'll give you the numbers. You can print a trillion dollars, it's 12 zeros. And in his, in his program with Anthony Pompliano, he talks about, you know, zeros, how important zeros are, but the Fed can print a trillion dollars in less than a minute, less than a minute. Mm -hmm. And if you spent a dollar a minute, it would take my mass off <clears throat> but who cares? It's only a couple of thousand years off. At a dollar a minute, it'll still take you 34,000 years to spend a trillion dollars, and it's your generation that's going to pay for it. Right. You know, they're bailing out the old guys like me. They're, every time the Fed prints money, it goes straight to Wall Street to prop up the stock market, and mom and pop baby boomer goes, oh, the stock market's up. But what um, Robert Breedlove is talking about is the shadow banking system, what he calls the pyramid, is crumbling. Mm -hmm. Because the only way money comes into existence is via debt. So the, so the Fed writes this check, the next level bank gets the check, and they lend it out, they lend it out, lend it out, lend it out, lend it out. So guys like myself get money for free. Mm -hmm. No interest rates. You know, we can do that. Right. But mom and pop on the street who, you know, they can't make the payment, so they go to a payday loan store, and the minimum they're gonna, you know, on a credit card is about 31% interest, which is really horrible, to 1,000% to interest. 
So this whole thing, the thing about the pyramid, that seeing eye on the dollar bill, it is screwing our own people. So that's why I'm becoming more and more around to, I don't want to be part of the communist system called the central bank. And central bank is, is a communist system. So what else did you think when he was saying? So to your point about the, the pyramid scheme, um, we all know modern, you know, MLMs or pyramid schemes is two different things, but kind of right. same idea where the top makes the most money. And as it gets passed down, the person making the least is often working the hardest. Correct. And I, th I think that's a good visual that when he's talking about the person at the bottom making the least, but working the hardest, that's like you're saying the average person saving money. Yeah. And it breaks my heart. You know, I was in Safeway last night and it's that person there that's checking out your food and moving it. They're working for that fake money. Mm -hmm. They don't have a prayer. And the Fed is printing as much as, as much as they want. They're just printing it. Mm -hmm. That's okay. why our schools teach us nothing about money because we screw people. We are a monetary system. So anyway, it's um, shocking. So anyway, uh, I want to thank everybody for listening to the Rich Dad Radio Show. Trust we open up your minds and disturb you. We're not saying that you should buy Bitcoin or, or it's the be-all, end-all. I'm just saying it's time to be aware. And the, the little Fed up there is like the Wizard of Oz. They're not nice people, you know. The Wizard of Oz, he might be a crook. Anyway, thank you all for listening to the Rich Dad Radio Show, and thank you, Sarah. It was a great, great interview. Yeah, thank you.